Hey, hello, everybody. Well, thank you very much for joining us for this third and final day of the uh, cross-border week. Uh, so uh, we're going to start today with an amazing session uh, with uh, Google Startups. Uh, and uh, before we, 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 we made the kickoff, I would like, I'll just give two quick messages in Portuguese and Spanish. So we make sure that everybody understands that we have a uh, live translation. So we, we have three different channels of audio here in Google, uh, in Zoom, I'm sorry. <laughs> that way uh, uh, our audience can uh, uh, hear us in Portuguese and in Spanish too. Então, muito rapidamente, sejam todos bem-vindos. Só para lembrar que se você desejar escutar essa sessão em português, há um botão embaixo no, no Zoom aqui em Interpretation, você pode clicar e selecionar o canal de áudio em português, em português. Assim você vai escutar tudo traduzido em tempo real para português. Então, mira, só para ser uma recordação que você, que você necessita escutar esta, esta uh, chamada em espanhol, hace, hace, hace clique em um link aqui em Zoom, Interpretation, e você pode acender a, a Spanish, espanhol, então você vai escutar a todo com uma tradu tradução simultânea para espanhol. So, well, thank you very much, guys. I would like to, uh, uh, to uh, invite uh, Victoria from Google Startups. Victoria is a startup um, a partner manager at Google and will be joined uh, here, will be joining us here today. And she will be the host for this uh, next 50 minutes. So, Vitória, thank you so much for joining us and welcome. Thank you so much, Diego, for having us. We are so excited to be here. Um, we have a lot in store for this hour, so excited to kick it off. And with that, um, I'll just give a quick introduction. I am the Google for Startups US Startup Partner Manager. And with me today, I have some of my global colleagues and teammates and friends. So, um, would love to bring up Henry, Miguel, and Mariama. So if you all just want to let us know where you are dialing in from, let's kick it over to Henry to start. All right. Welcome, everyone. So my name is Henry. If you speak English, if you speak Portuguese, it's more like Henry. So yes, once I already said what language uh, I'm, uh, is my name's from. So yes, I'm from Brazil. I speak from Sao Paulo. And well, welcome again. And then Miguel, where are you dialing in from? Hi guys, happy to be here. Good afternoon, morning for some of the folks in the call. Um, so I'm Miguel. I also speak the same language as my friend, Henry, uh, even though I'm Portuguese, uh, based in Spain, Madrid. Mariama, over to you. Hi everyone, I'm Mariama and I do not speak Portuguese, unlike my other two colleagues, <laughs> because <laughs> I am based in very, very rainy London in the UK, on a very tiny island on the other side of the world. Well, thank you all for dialing in. I'm, I'm really excited because as a Google for Startups team, we are a global team. So I'm really happy that we're able to really represent all of the work that Google for Startups is doing in the US and around the world. So with that, we'll kick it over to our first question. Um, for any of the startups watching or going to be watching this recording, we'd love to hear, you know, how can startups in these various regions stay connected to Google for Startups or get involved? Mariama, I'll kick that over to you to kick us off. Thank you so much. I mean, first of all, we do have an entire um, website filled with resources. I mean, there's directly content that founders have access to. There are um, the latest information and programs around the world. Um, certain relocations specify on specific industries or um, on diversity and inclusion. Um, for example, here in Europe, we focus very much on cybersecurity. We focus very much on sustainability and climate change this year. But then as well, we're very excited to be part of the Global Black Founders Fund, which we're again going to be launching. Um, so I definitely would tell founders the first step is go on the website, check out the different resources um, to get an understanding of like who we are, the work that we're doing globally, and how to best tap in. We do have as well startup school that is available to every founder around the world in different languages. I believe Portuguese is part of it as well. So uh, yeah, I would definitely um, would get a good understanding of 
what are the resources available to me? And then literally get a list together. I'm like, okay, these are the resources that are actually adding value to me as a founder and to my business over the next couple of months or even the next year. Thank you so much, Mariam. And you had uh, touched on our Global Black Founders Fund. Um, can you share a bit more on that? Yes, very excited and passionate about it. Um, so for those of you who don't know, Google for Startups has been supporting Black founders around the world over the last three years. So we kicked it off with our Black Founders Fund in the US, our colleagues then in Brazil uh, launched after, and then pretty much in Europe and then Africa. We've been focusing on early stage founders. Um, I mean, I do not want to bore you with some really, really bad statistics and numbers, but the fact is 0.5% of venture capital goes to to black founded businesses only. And this is where we want to make sure that black founders have access to funding. Um, hence, we're creating this fund and we're globally uh, deploying it and um, highlighting that uh, it's not a pipeline issue of black founders out there. It is actually like similar to women founders, a challenge of if you do not have people who look like you um, on the cap table, then you are going to have less access to funding. And if you look at the faces on the biggest venture capital firms around the world, well, there's still a huge lack of diversity when it comes to women and black people. So this is where we're trying very hard to signal to the ecosystem that if we want uh, if you want to support startups who build solutions for everyone in the world, then we have to include as well everyone in the world on the table and support those who do not, um, yeah, who are underrepresented. Thank you so much, Mariama. Miguel, I'll kick it over to you. How can startups get involved in your region? I think, I, I mean, I speak for Spain and Portugal, but in the end, I'm also speaking for Europe. Um, like Mariama said, our website has a ton of information um, and it's probably difficult to navigate. So before jumping into my region, I'll, I'll just like try to make it a bit easier for the ones in the call that would like to be involved. So let's say that out of the entire amount of content that we do provide for startups across the world, you could kind of split things into two buckets. And one of them would be what we call programs where you can get you know, in-depth relationship with Google for Startups and the, and, and the rest of the founders participating in this specific program. But we also build content uh, and programs like Mariama was saying, like startup school at scale that you can, that you can use, that you can also you know, um, invite your own teams to, to learn on specific topics that were created at scale. So I'll be focusing, uh, to, to your question, Victoria, I'll be focusing mostly on the, on the smaller cohorts programs that we do run in Europe. Um, Mariama has already commented uh, for, for the next year, we'll be highly focused on supporting early stage startups that are um, building products and services that really have an impact on the planet, uh, basically the entire 17 SDGs, that's kind of the focus, and at the same time supporting early stage companies uh, that are creating products or services um, around the cybersecurity world, um, That that that's the focus for next year, but Regarding last year, and, and again, touching on the on the diversity question, we did create programs just for uh, companies that were founded by at least one uh, woman, um, and was one of our main focuses last year. Um, and um, and regarding the question, uh, because I was checking here Pedro's question on, on the chat, like how can you apply all our programs that have open applications, so nothing is closed door or you know um, partner only. So I would say 100% of our programs across the world, they have applications open uh, where new startups that are not part of our community can um, apply. You fill out the form, uh, depending on the criteria for that specific program, uh, you'll be considered uh, and you'll go through a process, evaluation process. Maybe a bit more into that. Uh, and because um, Victoria just kicked off saying we are a global team, indeed we are, and we are part of a global company. However, we, we, we have to distribute somehow the work we do, right? So that's why you have people here uh, that sit in a small island in the middle of the Northern Sea, and you have some people that live in the sunny and lovely Brazil and people, you know. So the one thing to have in mind, I would say, if you are interested in participating in one of these programs is really see and pay attention to where is your company based and pay mostly attention to programs that tackle your region. Uh, because some of the programs might be limited for company headquarters. However, you, there's a very high likelihood that wherever you are, there's a program for you. Just have to pay attention for that specific fact, I would just say. Great. Thanks so much, Miguel. 
And then Henry, over over to you, Sunny Brazil. Yeah, the Sunny Brazil. So, uh, I do, well, I think they cover it all. I just I would like just to add that besides the website, we we have our active account on LinkedIn and the Instagram as well. So you can follow us there and see like the news besides the website. Uh, just to make sure like the applications are open and which programs are running right now, because of course it's going to happen during the, the, the year, but you need to, to be sure like when it, it's open. Uh, and just to, of course, we do have the Black Founders here in Brazil, as Mariama said, uh, but I would like to highlight other programs. Like we do have for, I would not say late stage startups, but seed or series A startups. Uh, that just receive a good amount of funding. We do have the Growth Academy here. So it's a program that goes deep in your, like the moment you just receive the funding, you don't know how to grow your team, how to grow your business. So this is what we are trying to support you with. And besides that, we do have more like a technical program for cloud. So if you are looking to develop your machine learning, your AI skills because you need that for your solution then we do have the cloud academy as well so those programs are a little bit late stage if I can say like series A or series B or something like this but we are gonna run that then in 2023 here in Brazil as well great and then I'll close it out here with um the you know what's on the horizon for the U.S. um this last year in 2022 was the first year we did the Latino Founders Fund, which was just incredibly exciting, building off of the momentum and the impact in the community we've seen with the Black Founders Fund. And Globalfy, uh, thank you again for having us here as one of our Latino Founders Fund recipients. And we are so thrilled that in 2023, we will once again um, have the Black Founders Fund and Latino Founders Fund, I think, touching similarly to what um, all my teammates and friends have said, we work with underrepresented earlier stage founders that are really looking to make an impact in their industry and communities at large. Um, so definitely keep your um, eyes and ears in the community, eyes on the LinkedIn and startups.google.com. That will be the best way to make sure that you are staying up to date when all of these applications are going live and the relevant criteria and locations for each um, program. And in our, our final few minutes here, we'd love to kind of get some, some real talk advice for any startup watching. Let's say they meet the location, they're in the relevant region, and they're at the relevant stage, what piece of advice would you give them for filling out their application to be a competitive applicant for um, any program that might be on the horizon? Was it, was it for me? So maybe uh, Miguel, I'll kick it over to you. What advice would you have for anybody applying? I think there's a little bit of an echo there. What advice would you have um, for any um, startup applicant looking to apply and be competitive. First. Can you guys hear me? Because I think I'm having some internet issues. I mean, I can as, go in the meantime. Yes, as, as Miguel is mobilizing, I'll kick it over to you, Mariama. Yeah, I mean, I definitely, when I go through the application of founders, I for me, it is important that the founder knows the industry inside out, the industry he or she operates in, um, like the competition, the the opportunity. And I think this just, just doesn't go for us. It goes as well for like, you know, angel investors and as well venture capitalists, right? It's like how well, because in order for you to build a solution, a tech solution to a program, to a problem, you really need to know, okay, this is, the industry I'm operating in. These are the key players. This is, you know, the partners that I aim to 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 partner with. Uh, these are the startups that I know, like, you know, they're already trying to tackle this problem, that tackle the problem in, in, through different ways. And this is exactly where my solution comes in. So I think this is for me always the first thing that I look at when I look at the fund, especially with early stage founders, you look at the founders themselves um, mm -hmm. just because they don't necessarily have the product yet, right? So, and when I look at the founders, this is for me, and um, we now see a big, big wave of climate tech companies, right? 
And then when I look at the founders, it's just like, are you trying to solve, uh, you know, climate tech because it's your hobby and you love the planet? Mm -hmm. Or are you actually trying to solve climate tech because you have a very deep understanding of what's actually happening to the planet? So this is, for, for me, very important. It's like, how relevant are your experiences as a founder um, to the problem or the solution that you're trying to build and to address? Thank you so much. I would just, um, you know, plus one to that. I think for me, it's like, what is the you in your unique selling um, proposition? Like, you know, many founders might be working in a similar space, but what sets the companies apart is the founder and the team that is building the product. So I would just say huge plus one to what you were sharing, Mariama. I think just make sure in any application that you really spend time highlighting what makes you and your team uniquely positioned, as well as don't lose that story. Like, what is that, that fire, that catalyst, that like, why won't I not stop building this and growing this even when the times get challenging? Um, Henry, over to you. Well, I guess you like this part of being unique and understand that it's all about people. It's top one for sure. But I would like to add something here, not just on the application, but just be sure and that you are ready to be in a, in a program like this, because of course you have to run your startups. You have to deal with a lot of things once you are a founder. And if you get in, in one of these like programs that we are saying, of course we, there will be some demand, that will be some events. So just be sure you are ready to make your agenda even busier than it, it is today. Because a lot of time we see people just want to be here just because it's Google and it seems all right. And once they got here, they understand that's like, oh, I, I cannot handle this. So, and the problem, of course, it's not going to do magic with you if you're not ready to receive it. And if you, you are not like, you are not willing and if you don't have time. So your participation in the program is the most important thing. So just be sure that this is the time, you know, like, this is the time for me to apply. This is the time that I can get the most. And this, this is the right time. Uh, I see a lot of really, really good founders with really good products sometimes just coming just because they want to sometimes receive the badge, the Google badge, or just because they, they think it's going to solve all their problems. We are not here to solve all your problems. We are here to help you guys. But for that, you need to, to have the time. You need to have the availability for, for us to help you as well. So that's that's kind of tricky. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Henry. Appreciate that. And then Miguel to close us out here. I'll I'll try to Miguel, I think I think your internet might be a little choppy if you want to drop it in the chat. I know everybody, it's such a cliffhanger here. I know you have some fantastic words of wisdom, but I think, you know, as many of we um, had shared today, make sure to check out the website, the LinkedIn, um, encourage you all to apply if the time is right for you and your business. Um, and don't hesitate to reach out on any of our social channels if you have any questions about our programs or resources, how to get involved, as well as um, stick around for all viewers uh, to meet some of our founders who've participated in some of the programs for the last half here. Thank you, Mariama, Miguel, and Henry. Next, really excited to welcome Sweta um, Gupta to share more about localization best practices, if we can bring up Sweta. Hello, hello. Can everyone hear me? I can hear you and I can see you. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Uh, I'm super excited to be here today, Victoria. Um, my name is Shweta and I work with the Google localization services team uh, in Google for the last three years. And my specialization was working with the devices and services that launched through Google across the world in the international markets. and. Um, I do work on different tools and strategies that involve localization services. So, um, Victoria, are we pulling up a slide over here? Um, yeah, are you able to share? Are you able to share your screen? Uh, I can try. Okay. Okay. 
Um, I all right, let's see if this works. Can anyone see the screen I'm presenting? Let's see. If you think that I can I can send it to you if you think that because I don't think I have the access to present. Um, um, I do not see it. Maybe uh, I'm not sure if someone from the Globify team, maybe that will be easiest in the meantime, if we can just start touching on some of the best practices. Um, if Diego. Yeah, yeah uh, I just think I just sent you the uh, deck, Victoria, in the meantime, if I'm happy to put it on the chat. Um, to I, I have it. Let me let me see if I can share here. Okay. Yes, you, you have access to set to, to share. Okay. Um, somehow I I can't see how I I have access, but I I think I have it here. Okay. All right. Perfect. Great. Uh, so I. Let's move on to the next slide. I'd already uh, did my introduction, but um, I don't want anybody to feel overwhelmed by looking at the slide. I'll give a preview, but mostly uh, we're going to talk about a little bit about what do we mean by localization by starting defining it. So localization is primarily translating your content, whether it's on a website, it's on an app, it's on a UI interface into a more culturally appropriate way for new audiences. So while translation is a huge part of it, uh, it's not everything. And localization usually comes up when uh, we are thinking of launching into new markets or into new local locales, and we want to reach new audiences. And the part of the processes that localization provides is it covers several steps and occurs at every stage of a product life cycle. So it's not just about translating the content into a different language. It's also about uh, trying to make sure that we take into account colloquial language or local phrases and the interpretation that would be seen differently in a lot of different markets. So why is this important? So localization is primarily important because English is one of the languages that we used to, uh, you know, we use normally to speak. However, in the most popular online language, uh, we are only able to reach one in four users by using English language, if I might say. And if you're only publishing in English, you're failing to reach at least 75% of our world's online population. And that's a huge percentage. So if we talk about how do we want to expand ourselves into international markets, we need to keep in mind how to, do we reach our audiences who understand beyond uh, US English. And I'll give you a very quick example. I work with the Pixel phone team that we have uh, in Google. And even when we are trying to launch a Pixel phone in countries like Australia or Ireland, while we are using English language over there, US English is not the one that pertains in these countries. We have to use Australian English or British English to kind of reach to our audiences in those countries. So localization comes very handy and proves to be super helpful in these situations. So now let's dive into the, you know, uh, the framework that you see in front of you. As you can see, there are localization steps that you can take at every step of development. So depending on whichever stage you are in, localization can come super handy in those steps. And that does not mean that everything, you have to do all of these steps every time. There are certain steps that you would do possibly when you are literally at the nurturing stage of a product or um, a solution, uh, something like research. So concept and planning, which involves doing the actual research, might happen at multiple points throughout the product life cycle, but this is the best place to start to understand who are your customers. And I'm sorry if I sound like a marketing 101 class over here, but truly what we need to understand is like, what is your content being 
where is your content being consumed right what are the languages that are being used who are you targeting who's your audience is it the gen z audience is it the users who are tech savvy are, is it for folks who are newer to the internet who are you reaching once we are able to see these dimensions and we are able to understand what tone what style what look vocabulary you will be able to use these questions will help you reach do more strategic research and understanding understand your users and target market when necessary next what you want to focus on is terminology now terminology focusing on terminology can definitely save you a lot of time money and headaches in the long run now what does it mean to do terminology before you start translating you should think how you will translate the name of your products or key features for example google doesn't translate in cognitive mode the mode that we have for private browsing on chrome from scratch every time it is something that we have done once we have established a translation that's always used allowing for clear and consistent user experience so we, so that we don't create confusion for our newer users we should always build a terminology guideline first and accordingly we should craft a style guide to document some of the principles that guide how you want your product to sound in a particular market do you want a formal tone do you want an informal tone do you want the use of a slang do you want the use of a jargon all of these different components and finally we will reach the part where we can talk about translation now as your engineering team is working they should provide context to the strings and strings are actual words or actual terms that they are working on in other words it they will need to add an explanation of what is meant by a particular word or phrase now let me pause here quickly i have been speaking a lot and i i know i don't expect everybody to understand everything but let's go to the next slide and let's do a small exercise very very small exercise all right now here it's a little bit of participation that's required now let me see if it's another for me it's i'm on the pst so it's 8:30 in the morning but if anybody was feeling like getting a coffee let's do this exercise and probably after that we can do that all right so you are able to see the word bat over here now when you look at this what do you picture in your head when i say bat what do you picture can someone unmute and add to the conversation okay that's okay we will look at some of the examples that we can use now when when i say the word bat the first picture that comes in my mind uh, mind is and victoria you'll have to click is this i'm thinking of a bat hanging upside down somewhere in one of the biggest caves in asia however i was talking about this word to my son last night and he was thinking about about a baseball bat because he loves watching baseball and when i was talking to my husband he was thinking about a cricket bat because he loves watching cricket so there are other some more ways of looking at the word bat now how about batting your eyelashes sometimes we use it as a verb where we say we are batting our eyelashes and if someone wants to cross reference to the largest extent somebody would be picturing a cat and picture this lovely display of affection but bat can also mean to discuss like bat some eyebrows around or it can also refer at batting again in the sports context so let me stop here so unless your engineering team is actually providing a context as to what is meant by bat in a particular phrase you run into the risk of poor translation bat wouldn't necessarily be wrong of all these things are bats but they could be totally wrong given the context so moving on to the next slide um and i promise that this is going to be my last slide and we can have more discussion after this but you will also want to make sure that you're using engineering best practices for providing context but other than that you are also using it for separating codes from translation using placeholders in string uh, not every word or every phrase is written in the same way not con uh, you know considering many languages are longer than english and requires 
spacing requirements and have different ways of writing certain sentences and phrases. Now, one other thing that is required as part of the localization um, process is finding a localization service or provider. Now you will want to think about what's appropriate for your product or your company. Usually this means using something other than a free translation service and considering localization providers. Now, if you're launching an app via the, let's say as an example, if you're launching an app via Play Developer Console, you're able to request and pay for human translation via Google Play app translation services. Now, this is available in some languages, not all. Uh, and you can also take advantage of machine translation, which is one of the quicker ways of doing translations nowadays at no cost. However, this is not provided in all languages. Uh, like I said, I think that free machine translation and console is available in Japanese and there's a lot of positive effect around it. I am not, um, I, I, there's a bunch of languages which can be looked up. And beyond translation, the other steps that are involved is doing QA testing and building your testing into your launch timeline. In most cases, development may be happening in phases. So therefore, uh, translation also happens in phases and completing testing ensures that you're looking at the finished product and ensuring that everything is coming together well and you don't have any truncated content. Things make sense in context. And then it's launch time. Um, Post-launch localization continues in forms of additional language expansions, localization for new features and or research. So these are certain steps. Uh, this is not this is not gonna fit one size fits all. Every, every company, every startup team would be uh, participating differently, but this is exactly what we look at when we are talking about localization. So I'm gonna stop here and I'm gonna take some questions if we have time else, you know, Victoria is here and we can uh, reach out to our team and answer any questions that you might have beyond this. Yes, um, we are on time, right on time. So thank you so much. I think, you know, the key takeaway here is localization is just not about translation because there's much exactly. more nuance involved. So definitely make sure you are taking the time doing it intentionally and involving many parts of your team to actually make the localization effort a success. So thank you so much for joining us, especially um, so early on your end. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. And then with that, let's bring thank up so our, our founder panelists. So closing us out here, super excited to welcome our global um, founders from across the world, across the world. So Diego and team, let's bring up those founders now. We've got founders dialing in from all over the world. Hello, hello. 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 Good hello, morning. Miriam. Hi, Andres. Hello, Fernando. So hello, hello. Um, as the founders are dialing in, let's just kick off. Um, let us know where you're dialing from, what is your startup name, and then in one sentence, sentence what does your startup do? I can, I can jump in. Um, so my name is Miriam. Nice to meet everyone. Thank you again for, for having us, um, Victoria and the whole Global Five team. Um, my startup is called Kamoyo Insights and we help global companies get feedback from consumers across Africa. Fernando, I'll kick it over to you. Thank you, Victoria. And thank you so much to the team for the opportunity to be taking part in this event. I am Fernando. I am the CEO of Boxes. This week, I am calling from Uruguay, Montevideo, where I was born. We are a software and hardware startup powering the future of retail. And we have developed two use cases of our devices. Our first use case is a sampling device, where we give three samples and also have the ability to gather data from consumers' interaction with our devices. And our second use case is a refilling device, where consumers use a smart reusable packaging 
to refill consumers' products, on cleaning products, personal care products, for example. Awesome. And then Andres, bring us home. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Andres. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Koali. We are a job marketplace for recent Latin American grads. We rank them using artificial intelligence based on motivation and career goals. Uh, currently, I am in Bogota um, and I'm living in New York. Great. And then with that, you know, we'd love to hear. Um, tell us a little bit more. How have you been involved with Google for Startups? Um, we will kick it over with you, Andres. Give us a start. Awesome. So, so th thank you for that. I, I have participated first in, in Google for Startups in the uh, Founders Academy, uh, in where I had the, the pleasure to learn about sales and, and actually to learn about value proposition. I, I was a founder that I started like for, by solving the problem of how we can reduce youth unemployment in Latin America or from Latinx uh, recent grads. Uh, in Google for Startups, I was able to, to learn, like to, to learn to think about the, the companies uh, uh, that they are the ones that are hiring the grads. And later on, um, I'm right now part of the Latin Founders Fund, where I have been, uh, been having the possibility to advance on, on, this, on this matter and, and scaling it. Great. And then over to you, Fernando. Y yes, Vicky, about how I connect with Google for Startups? Yes. Yeah. Tell us a little bit yeah. about your Google for Startups experience. Yeah. L last year, we, we started in Uruguay, a 3.5 million people country a few years ago. And last year, we wanted to grow. We wanted to go faster. And we started to apply to accelerators in the US. And in 2021, we were accelerated by Techstars. And after that, we joined Capital Factory. is uh, an accelerator and venture fund from Texas. And they nominate us so that we can apply to the Google Latino Founder Fund. Uh, and here we are, so excited to be part of the family. And then I see Christian just joined us. Thank you so much, Christian, for joining us. Um, where are you? And Dami as well. Um, would love to just kick off. Where are you dialing in from? Tell us um, a little bit, a sentence or two about your startup and how you've been involved with Google for Startups. Sure thing. Apologies about the lateness. What's the tech panel without tech difficulties, right? Um, so I'm uh, Christian. I'm the CEO and co-founder of AudioMob. Uh, we basically invented uh, non-intrusive audio ads in games. So those annoying video ads you get in mobile games, imagine that you can keep you know, driving your car and listening to an audio ad instead. That's a little bit about uh, what we do. I'm calling from Abu Dhabi, which is where our R&D lab is based. And we're currently undergoing an international expansion right now. Fantastic. Hi everyone, sorry, I almost coughed there. Uh, my name is Dami, I'm the founder and CEO of Moonhub. Uh, we're essentially ending death by PowerPoint uh, by reinvigorating corporate training and allowing companies to actually get some return on investment for this. Uh, and we do this by essentially simulating what employees will face on a day-to-day -day basis uh, and allowing them to capture some really interesting data points from simple actions such as a look and a click. And then they can track those metrics over time as time grows on. Uh, I'm from London. Uh, I'm based in London at the moment. Uh, do not be deceived by the sunset there. This is the first time I've seen the sun in five days. Um, and yeah, uh, I was part of Google's Black Founders Fund, Fund 2. Um, and that's my involvement with Google for Startups. Awesome. So um, I think we were just, Miriam, would love to kind of hear about your experience with Black Founders Fund as well. And then we'll move on to touching a bit on the expansion, the international expansion piece. Awesome. Yeah, I think I forgot to mention that I'm, I'm based in, in Brooklyn, New York, um, but my headquarters are between Brooklyn and Nigeria. And so um, in terms of my Google for Startups um, Black Founders Fund journey, it's been um, nothing short of amazing. Um, I think um, the way that uh, I, our company has been able to grow largely was around um, the, start, uh, the Startup Sales Academy um, program and learning how to boost our sales. And when we came in, I think we had about maybe three or four um, uh, co companies on onboarded and, and leaving. Um, we've been able to sign companies like uh, Facebook and Meta, working actually with Google, um, onboarding with them, as well as expanding um, our pipeline to, to, I think, almost double um, in size. And so the Sales Academy by far was, was probably the most um, impactful as and outside of our startup academy um, uh, mentor, um, shout out to Princess. Um, she has been uh, someone that we meet with 
um, on a monthly, almost biweekly basis, depending on uh, timing. And um, even working with her, she was able to connect uh, us with not only um, the people within the Black Founders Fund um, in the U.S., but also with um, the Black Founders Fund Africa. So even being able to partner with funds across the network has been amazing. Thank you so much for highlighting that. And I think this um, starts touching on one of the questions in the chat, which is other than the investment through our Black and Latino Founders Fund, um, what other um, support do the startups get in the community? So would love to kind of just touch on what support have you received, um, Miriam? I know you have just touched on the sales academy and the sales training. Would love to hear, let's start with um, Christian, would love to hear a little bit about what additional support did you receive from Google for startups? Um, I know I've prepared notes, but like it, 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 there are so many things. It's like everything under the sun, to be honest. Um, everything from brand recognition, press, case studies, connections to every kind of mentor we could possibly think of at Google from how to manage people. Um, I remember there was a guy called uh, Jade that we uh, connected with that helped with um, sales ops and forecasting, uh, which which was critical to our very successful first year in business. Um, marketers, operations, like is literally absolutely everything <laughs> because um, uh, they they made it quite clear that that you know you get out what you put in. So this is this isn't just things that's thrusted at you. It's like you ask and you will receive. So. Um, it was absolutely everything and um, executive training and uh, mentorship to help develop the business in all these areas was incredible. Fantastic. Andres, what about for you? I have uh, received mainly like the help in, in, in three ways. Uh, the, the, the first one is like the uh, definition of like my value, what, what value I'm adding to, to my customers. And in that sense, like those are, are the companies. So like the, the uh, Google for Startups helped me like connecting with different founders so that I, I really learned what they were looking for, like for hiring a, a Latin American grad. Uh, the second help is as, as Maria mentioned, like the Sales Academy. I, I was like forming in several areas like that, analytics, like management, so on and so forth, but not sales. So actually it was uh, like my, my, my first like connection to the sales department like in, a, in a US ecosystem. And that has uh, catapulted myself and my company uh, a lot. So I, I think that was, was key. And, and the third part, but, but not least, is the, is the help from the mentors from, from Google. Uh, because like uh, you, you there like got several areas and several mentors in, in, in different parts of your business that actually you can, uh, like uh, learn from them as your bosses. So, so uh, in that in that area, I was able to learn from like their, their insights and so on and so forth. Fantastic. And then um, just any anyone any other panelists, Fernando, uh, Dami, any other additional resources and support that you'd want to call out as part of your Google for Startups experience? Yeah, yes, I mean, uh, oh, so I'll let you go. Go ahead, Damio. Go, go ahead, please. Oh, no, sure. I mean, Christian uh, did a really good job of, of listing out basically everything. Um, yeah, the mentors, uh, the access to fantastic investors, um, definitely the PR recognition, and then also just the access to fantastic uh, people who have already done it um, and can give brilliant advice. I think the network effect that Google has, uh, especially like the time and the hours that they actually put into really nurturing the relationships with each founder. Uh, I don't know how they managed to do it. Uh, there were so many people, um, you know, on the Black Founders Fund that I was just, I was so impressed with this. Yeah, how, how fantastic the program was. Thank you so much. I know Mariama is going to be very happy to be uh, to be hearing those sentiments and the entire Google for Startups team. So thanks so much for sharing that. Oh, Mimi's here. Nice. Um, F Fernando, over to you to close us out on this. Yes, thank you, Victoria. We have had the opportunity to meet great mentors, great founders. Also, the free equity cash that we received it was very important for us. And we are also having great support from the Google Cloud team. For example, we are powering our developments at the moment in the Google Cloud. And we have like 20 Google engineers helping us. So what, what else can we ask? And of course, having Google backing us help us to, to gain credibility in, in the US. In our case, we came from Uruguay, from South America. So it's very important having Google backing us. Perfect. And that actually segues to our first kind of internationalization and globalization question. Just really quickly, round robin. Um, where was the your initial market of focus? And can you touch a bit on what markets are you 
currently expanding to, have already expanded to, or are working with in some capacity. So Fernando, since you touched on that, um, let's kick it over to you and then we'll go to Mar Mariam. Yes, sure. In our case, we started, as I shared with you, in South America, South America while we were assigned at university. So our first market has been Uruguay, but we wanted to grow, we wanted to go faster, and we started to apply to accelerators in the US. Now, and for obvious reasons, our, mar our focus market is the United States, which is 100 times larger than the Uruguayan, Uruguayan market. Thanks so much. Uh, Miriam, over to you. Yes, um, so our first market was Nigeria, um, given that um, that was what we had the most familiarity with, and um, I'm on Nigerian descent, my co-founder is based in Nigeria. Um, so we started there, but we had always had plans of, of expanding, and so um, we and mostly still focused within um, across the continent. So we've since expanded to Ghana, um, Rwanda, South Africa, and Kenya. Largely, we were um, focusing on expanding to markets that had large tech hubs across the continent. Great. Christian, over to you. Just on mute in there. So um, because we launched in 2020 and every market collapsed, we like tried to start in the uh, in the UK, um, but we ended up pickpocketing um, random countries in Europe, but we really concentrated on the US. Um, so we really started global because we're an advertising company where someone, you know, um, installs a game and then wherever in the world that users installed the game, we could see them. So yeah, we concentrated on the U S, um, and then we basically follow where the opportunities are uh, globally. And then Dami. Uh, yeah, we started in the, um, so our pattern is UK based, although it's now patent pending in the U S, uh, and we officially launched our products in 2020 after some years of R and D, um, in the last sort of 12 months, we've now been pulled outside of the UK a little bit. So in mainland Europe, uh, and now more recently into the U S so yeah, definitely an interesting expansion time. Uh, although we have raised seed and, you know, we're being pulled into these different countries. So it's an interesting, uh, experience, um, for us at the moment, which is good. Thanks so much for sharing that. Andres, close us out. So we, we first started a couple of months in, in Colombia, in Bogotá specifically, to actually get uh, the enrollment from several recent grads uh, from, from uh, Colombia at first. Uh, however, after like some months, we, we moved uh, to Miami and we started capitalizing the Latin American market in the in the US so, so that we have extended that market like in, in, the, in the whole years. And right now we are currently like touching base the, the Latin American market in New York City. Great. And then I know we're close on time, so definitely want to make sure we touch on this. Um, in regards to navigating, um, working with international markets and expansion, um, you know, what insights or resources have you found particularly helpful or any kind of aha moments that you can impart on any founder tuning in here? Um, let's start with Miriam. Okay, yeah. So um, I'm not saying it's just because we're a research company, but research um, I think is extremely key, um, especially because um, I think, you know, sometimes um, people come into a region and think like a country represents that region. And and um, that's definitely not the case, especially within uh, within Africa, even just the simple payments across con countries is difficult in, in itself. So actually doing the research to understand the market, is, I think, is is probably step one. Um, and then secondarily, understanding like um, language, I think the power of words is is very under um, utilize, but extremely powerful. The simple fact of just even having a copywriter, even if you can work with them on a, um, you know, per project basis that speaks the language that understands the language, um, and can use kind of, you know, special tones or, or common inside, inside jokes, um, within that country would actually make your product seem like you're a part of the culture versus you're coming in to try to understand it. I love that. And that just touches on um, you know, our talk on localization. It's not just about translation. It's really important to capture that nuance to be actually localized. Um, Fernando, over to you. Any insights, resources that you found helpful navigating multiple markets? Yeah. Every market from our experience is different. You need to understand the culture in every market, the market landscape, which competitors, direct or indirect competitors do you have? And one insight could be that for us it has been very important to build a network in the US, a network who help us with intros, with connections, with advice. So it's very important 
when you are going into new markets and you are a startup and start building a powerful network who works with you. Great. And then um, Dami, over to you. I think in the meantime, we'll pass it over to Andres. So or, for uh, me, for, also drop it in the chat. Uh, for, for me, uh, I, I have like two, two, two important points that actually go like through, through World for Startups. It was first uh, clustering and B2B, so, so clustering companies uh, like in groups. And, and, and mapping their needs and then like choosing one cluster and then identifying uh, the buyer person on base of that cluster that was that was key uh, that was key for us and then the second is like in, in base of the market uh choosing a beach hill market that can be like a neighborhood or, or, or a city uh to to, to start growing uh, those are my, my, my two resources or help and then christian uh, dami it seems like mike is working yeah, no, sorry, I, it connected to my, uh, so to speak, but I'll let Christian go. Well, thank you, Dami. Um, so, kind of a couple of things. Don't prepare for the worst, prepare for the best. Growth revenues can come from pretty much anywhere. Like the next billion users, for instance, are gonna, are gonna come from India and Africa, but the next most advanced trading block is gonna be the UAE. They're trying to make it like a very rich, advanced version of Europe. Um, with cultural differences, make no assumptions, take the ego out of it, uh, out of the equation, and learn quickly. Like, for instance, in the OEE, people will talk about uh, just random things like cars and holidays on a $20 million deal. And then they'll just, at the last five minutes, go, okay, yeah, take the deal. Like, it's it's in, it's crazy but uh, to, to me, but at the same time, it's uh, uh, one of the cultural differences. So that, that, that's what I've learned. Thanks so much. Dami, uh, close us out. Sure. Well, and just to clarify, cultural differences is this between uh, sort of predominantly where I am and then like where we've expanded internationally too exactly exactly yeah. any yep yeah uh, definitely uh, culture differences I would 100% do not assume that uh, the price that people will pay where you are domestically is the same elsewhere um, for us it's kind of been the reverse uh, internationally whenever we've pitched our prices um, they said okay what is it like or what it, how much is it outside of setup and we're like Side of setup, what do you mean? Like, what's the actual recurring fee? And we're thinking, oh, yeah, the recurring fee is X, Y, and Z. And we're thinking, oh my goodness, okay, so in one market, you may be undercharging. The UK is criminally known mm -hmm. for having a, a tight wallet, whereas the US, for example, they just they spent. Uh, and it's really about adjusting universal pricing that you know you may miss a fair few of the net, let's say, in one region, but what you capture in the net in another region more than makes up for it, um, what you've lost in, in, in one. Amazing. Well, I know we're at time. Thank you all. I know, um, you know, with bringing together a global community, we're dialing in from vastly different times. I see it's dark there in the, the UK. So thank you so much for dialing in. And I think, you know, really to synthesize, don't make assumptions about your customers, about your competitors, and about your product and other markets, making sure that you're really taking intentional time through research, through connection, through interviews, to really getting to know the customers in that space and the markets you're expanding. So thank you all so much. We're so happy you're part of our community. And thank you again to Globalfy, um, one of our Google for Startups Latino Founders Fund recipients, for letting us have this time to share more about our community. Oh, well, uh, Victoria, first of all, thank you very much for our time. Thank you very much for hold, hosting this call and making sure that we could, I mean, that you could, uh, I mean, you, you took care of the session, right? You invite entrepreneurs, you make sure that you were sharing a really uh, helpful and rich content to, to everybody. So thank you very much for, for everybody that joined us. I mean, for us as a company, it was amazing to be part of the Google uh, the first Google uh, uh, Latin, Google for Startups Latino Fund. Uh, it, and it's definitely not just about the investment. I mean, of course, the $100,000 uh, really helped us last year uh, in the process of launching the, the banking service. But the networking that it brought us, uh, the access to mentors from all over the world that are part of Google uh, was amazing. And I personally had one of the most... Uh, uh, impressive experience of my life going to uh, the NASDAQ in New York to the ring bell for the, for the, uh, like, uh, the um, uh, Latino month celebration over there. So the Hispanic celebration, it was amazing. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much for our time. Thank you very much from everybody from Google, for all the other entrepreneurs. 
And now we're going to head up here with Marcelli uh, talking a little bit more about e-commerce. So thanks so much, guys. Have a good one, okay? Thank you.